Welcome to First Impressions, the podcast where we talk about our love for Jane Austen and give a big middle finger to all the haters. I am Kristen and I'm joined by Maggie. Hello! And today we're talking about the BBC radio drama version of Mansfield Park starring Benedict Cumberbatch as Edmund and Felicity Jones as Fanny. Felicity <laughs> Jones, as everyone knows from, uh, oh my God, Northanger Abbey. Like, what is it? I got everyone, listeners, dear listeners, <laughs> uh, gentle listeners. I am now another year older, if not necessarily a year wiser. And also I can't remember anything anymore. So middle yeah, age is coming birthday. for you all. Thank you. I'm 44. Can you believe it? I cannot. I really wasn't sure I'd live this. No, I'm not just kidding. Um, but yes, yeah, so Felicity Jones, who we all know as Kathy in Northanger Abbey, making her second Austin heroine debut in the BBC Radio Mansfield Park. Yes, and some other notable cast members, Dave, uh, um, David Tennant. It's so good. It's so good. And I never realized Tom, the character of Tom Bertram, was such a comic character. Until like I, it makes you like Tom. Yeah, it's just, it's just so funny. It just um, really goes to show like what having amazing actors can do. For, this is like what we always say where I I love Mary Crawford because Haley Atwell played her in a not great adaptation, but it just makes me love the character. I feel like David Tennant has done that for Tom Bertram. Who would have thought? Um, do you want me to kind of go down? I've got the list right here. Do you want me to say some of the... Yes, but well, I'll just toss out one other one, which was the Henry Crawford in this version was exceptional and changed like my whole feelings about everything. It changed my perspective on the whole. Anyway, um, but I didn't, I didn't look up a cast list, and and we were just chatting, and I was like, "Who is that guy? He was so good. Who was he, Maggie? <laughs> James Callit, who I'm sure our listeners know because he was in Bridget Jones's Diary. He played her gay best friend." In Bridget Jones's diary, and Kristen and I know him as Doctor Baltar. <laughs> yeah, in, yeah, uh, Battlestar Galactica. But he, remember, he was also in Oftenland. Yes, he was a gay um, character in that too. Actually, gay didn't character. He? Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, uh, he is just incredible. I mean, yeah, I just I was like fangirling all over once I realized who you know who he was. But he uh, even before that, his performance just really moved me. I want to shout out some other people. The narrator, so basically Jane Austen, is played by Amanda Root, who, of course, we all know from Persuasion. Benedict Cumberbatch is Edmund Bertram. Felicity Jones is Fanny Price. James Callis is Henry Crawford. Jemima Ruper is Julia Bertram, who I love because she's the in Lost in Austin. She's the main character in Lost in Austin, where she like travels through a Narnia-like door into the pages of Pride and Prejudice. It's really fun. Mary Crawford is played by an actress called Susan Lynch, where you don't know the name, but if you look up her picture, I promise you've seen her before. She's an Irish actress. And Mr. Rushworth was Toby Jones, and I immediately knew it was him because he's so distinctive sounding to me, what? at least. Really? Him? Yeah. Oh my God. He's so, and of course, I can't think of Toby Jones without thinking of him from the MCU, where he plays like this little German fascist, basically, yeah. <laughs> in Hydra. But I just think he's so cute. I love him so much. And I mean, David Tennant, he, they get, they fleshed him out a little more, I think. Well, everybody had more dialogue because it's a radio drama, so it's almost all dialogue. Um, we had a little bit of narration kind of at the front and end, kind of drive home the big theme of this Mansfield Park, which is kind of change is coming to Mansfield Park and how will everyone respond to it? But a lot of dialogue was written and added. So everyone kind of got more than they would in the book to say. But everyone was so great. I loved it. I mean, I loved it. Kristen, you are the Mansfield Park expert. What did you think? I loved it too. And I I think the most exceptional thing about it is that the person who wrote it, adapted it for radio, whose name I don't even know, shame on me, I'm sure you have it, did a fantastic... Lynn Colin. Lynn Colin. And produced by Sally Avens. Did a fantastic job writing additional dialogue that, first of all, didn't sound modern. It sounded like it could. It weaved in seamlessly with Austin's dialogue, which is hard to do. Hard, it's, hard, it's like deceptively hard to do. 
But it also casts additional light on the characters. Absolutely. And some seeds scenes were made up out of whole cloth and they were these little grace notes. Um, yeah, a scene would have happened here where X person would have said this and Y person would have said that plot wise, but gave a new depth to the character of Fanny Price in a way that I loved, that I really dug, that made her a genuinely likable character. And they didn't do it by making her spunky. They did it by making her sympathetic, intelligent, emo like emotionally intelligent, and also made her kind of a counselor to others, to Mariah, to Julia, in a in a very in a way that makes you like her a lot more than just yeah. corner sitting judgy Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> it made me like Fanny Price. It made me like Edmund. It made me like Tom. It really made Fanny being in love with Edmund and him being totally clueless feel real. And I, a lot of it is the writing. And I'd say 50% writing, 50% performance because everyone is fantastic, right? But I mean, it made me like Edmund and that's not easy, easy to do. Um, they, but they had they had genuine chemistry too, and I wonder if they were in the same room because sometimes with recording these things, you were just in a booth by yourself, and if that's the case, then everyone did a really incredible job because it's hard to, to have chemistry with nobody. But but she, I mean, even had a little like wet, witty repertoire. You know, they like had their little. They would tease each other a little bit, and you could really feel their closeness and the friendship. That on her side was clearly something more. I don't know. I just loved it. And everyone knows Mansfield Park is not my favorite. But as soon as it ended, I share an office with my husband. I looked at Bayard and I was like, that was amazing. I'm going to listen to it again. And I started at the beginning and listened to it again immediately. I think loved about, it so much. The thing about the book is uh, Edmund is the Pygmalion and he carves Fanny. And mentally, she's just a satellite of him. Whereas in this adaptation, she's been raised, yes, with his ideals, but she does have her own mind and her own morals that she can reflect back at, you know, and in one scene, they even argue, they fight, man. And that was exhilarating to me in a way. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's not Mansfield Park, like it takes that sinister element away from it, but it, it certainly makes it a more living, breathing story. Absolutely. I don't know. I think that for me, Mansfield Park has, it's almost like some people who try to read Lord of the Rings and they can't get past the like really long descriptions of what the trees are like yeah. or the entire history of the elves. And so it makes it more difficult to dig into what the story is about. And Mansfield Park for me is unfortunately, I can't get through some of it's not filler, but there's things that are surrounding the story that make it very difficult for me to penetrate it to the emotions that are inside of it. And the dramatization sort of has to jettison all of that to just get to the characters and their relationships and the story. And so it made it so much more accessible to me and for me to really love it and understand it. There's a there's such a beautiful scene at the end between Fanny and Tom where he's recovering from his illness when he has decided to, you know, he kind of learned his lesson, I guess you could say. He's turned over a new leaf. They're in the garden talking to each other and she's kind of pointing out the plants and giving their Latin names and what they do. And he's kind of teasing with her and being funny, but also interested. And it was such a great little scene. And it sewed me told told me so much about their characters. I loved it. Oh, I loved it too. And that was another little grace note. Like there were so many mm -hmm. of them making Fanny a naturalist, mm -hmm. you know, and and bringing her, connecting her to that natural world, and connecting her to Mansfield Park in it in a more, I don't know, organic it's a way. Real, yeah, but like she literally loves the property so much. She knows everything about it from like the smallest little plant here to like one bush where it's like she knows that this branch is always bent on that bush so when she gets shoves into it it's not a big deal things like that yeah. were really yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and that's he another... falls over mr crawford when she finds out william is coming and and he's like oh i fared better than the bush and she's like oh no 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 that one's always been wonky <laughs> i love that and then he goes i know how it feels and that's the other thing. He gets a lot of witty dialogue. You get to actually hear Henry Crawford joking around and being funny. 
which I loved as well. And he has great chemistry with Felicity Jones also. And so the the tension of the latter half of Mansfield Park when he's courting her and she is resisting him. Sure. And, and, just, and as a listener, I'm like, girl, go for it. Like, yeah. this is, yeah, right? What a great match. Like, oh my God. And so it really also, you know, people debate, should she have married him or not? Would he have run off with Mariah if she had said yes? I think it kind of really makes that, you know, she, it seems like it was, she would have been really happy with him and he seemed to like her. Like, who knows what would have happened? Oh my God. Now I'm saying so many things, but I, I want to interject too, that it was so hot, like him and his mono, his monologue about how he really deserves her. I mean, you're just a hundred percent engaged. And and Mary Crawford and Edmund, you get to hear them. the play. And I'm fanning myself. You can't see it, but that was that was pretty hot. <laughs> that was hot shit. And no no other adaptation has ever made me believe in Edmund and Mary Crawford the way it did with this one. So it emotion. Sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Benedict Cumberbatch has chemistry with like a rock. <laughs> but it may, I may, I literally was thinking, maybe we should watch a version of Lover's Vow. Like, it's pretty good. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's just like, oh, you taught me love. You can teach me love. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> shit. <laughs> but him, he's got a hot voice too, right? His Benedict Cumberbatch, like, he, really he can read the phone book. No, it was really great. So, and I hate to just jump in and like say all the things because I'm so excited to like talk about it just in general. And I've just like hit all of my notes already. Yeah, no, say all the things. I will just respond to what you say. And I just want to say that I'm so glad you liked it because I loved it so much. But I know that Mansfield Park is so special to you. It was going to like really be heartbreaking if I loved it so much and you were like, this is terrible. I was just going to be so devastated. Oh no, I'm a I'm a red blooded woman, man. I can be seduced by Benedict Cumberbatch's voice, just like any of us. Yeah. I will say I tried to listen to this before, like I already owned it, and um, it's always hard with a story you're really, really familiar with at the very beginning because you're like, yes, I know she's moving to Mansfield, I know, and that part was pretty straight ahead. The beats, like Mrs. Norris, and you yeah. know, blah, 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 and I'm like, okay, it's a radio drama. I don't. I don't I, I don't really listen to things without picture because I'm I don't know, I get very angry. That's right. You're not a podcast person, which yeah, is that great so irony. I had to play Candy Crush while I was listening to this and then I cleaned my bathroom. So totally valid. I totally yeah. valid. <laughs> I, I mean, I listened while I worked, actually. Because I can I I have a type of job where I can use unless I'm writing, I can listen to things. Yeah. So when I'm looking through mountains of medical records or whatever, I listen to stuff all the time. Um, I will say the first episode, so it's four hours, four, like about one hour episodes. I thought the first hour, not a lot happens. It's just sort of setting the stage, introducing us to all the characters. Like when the first episode ended, I was like, oh, was that it? Because like Amanda Root comes back and is talking to you change was coming to Mansfield. Nice. And I was yeah. like, oh, okay. Well, like that went by really fast. Not much happened. Maybe they're less than an hour. Um, but then things pick up. They got through it. I have to say they did speed through the beginning of the story. They they kind of sped through the, the trip to Sutherland. Uh, mm -hmm. It all was happening quite fast. And, and then they get to uh, Lover's Vows and they just did so many clever things to go jump forward faster. Like Mr. They Yates did time. skip a lot from the Sutherland visit. We got a little bit of her like being left on her own and tired, but there's a whole bunch there that got cut for sure. Yeah, but they left in the most important moments of um, them, uh, you know, her making a joke about the clergy and then they go outside and he feels the connection of her arm for the first time, like those emotional beats. And then with when Rushworth comes back and he's pissed because Crawford and Mariah's went through the this this locked door that everyone can apparently just pass through it never really well no they climbed out. over the fence <laughs> julia was like well this sucks i'm out of here and just and i was kind of like she, that was awesome she just like full-on threw herself over a fence which i thought was pretty rad actually but there yeah. was no mention of the haha -ha, and i was quite disappointed yeah and no i, I cannot get out as the starling said but that but that's okay that's okay but yeah they 
Fanny uh, is left on the bench and then they like cut. And that's fine. You know, it, some of the cuts, I will say I was a little bit whiplash. And part of that is just because I know the story. Right. Right. I was reading the um, like comments on the, the radio drama, like reviews from people who were like, and one of them said, I got very confused and it felt very jerky. I was like, where are they now? Where are they now? Where are they now? But, you know, to get a story like that into, um, I thought it was only three hours, actually. Well, like, I thought it was four. I can check. I have it on Audible. You can download it on Audible, everyone. I signed up for an Audible account because of it. And they, there you yeah. go. A whole hour um, after Henry Crawford proposes to her. Uh, oh, you're right. It's only two hours and 18 minutes. I don't know. I guess I just felt like it was longer because so much <laughs> happened. Yeah, so much does happen. It's wild. Yeah. It's, it's less than two and a half hours. Yeah. So, and then so when good. once Crawford proposes to her, I look down at my ticker, my time, and it said 55 minutes left. And I'm like, okay, they're really going to nail it. They're, they're really going to nail her in Portsmouth, really going to nail. But I was surprised because they made some timeline adjustments so that Fanny, mm -hmm. because it's a radio drama and you yeah. want people to be talking to each other. So I thought it worked. I thought, it, I thought worked. it worked too. I thought it worked too. She's out at Portsmouth and she's getting a melange, a montage of letters, which was smart. But then as soon as Tom gets sick, they yank her back to Mansfield. And it's Sir Thomas who reads the article, the item, the blind item in the newspaper. And then Mary Crawford comes in person to tell her, hey, it'd be cool if, if Tom died. Right. <laughs> Which, you, again, you kind of have to do. It's boring if she's just reading a letter, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And there was also a flashback. There were a couple flashbacks where they showed like Edmund and Mary talking to each other. I think there was a flashback of that. Yes. Um, so if you weren't listening carefully, you might be confused as to where people were if you didn't catch like, oh, this is something that happened like off screen kind of. Um, yes. But I loved that. Like as soon as Tom gets sick, everyone needs to be together. Like it was great. I thought that was a great decision, by the way. The need to have dialogue also introduced a great little grace note that they added where Fanny is in Portsmouth with Susan. She's building that relationship with Susan and they read together. But they with read Shakespeare. They read plays. They read Shakespeare out loud to each other so you don't see Fanny as some kind of prude who doesn't approve mm -hmm. of things. You know, that she she is imaginative and she does engage in that. And how much did you love Portsmouth? Just the way they I, did it. Yes, I did. And I will say again, this is the second time I've seen, I can't remember which version of Mansfield Park it was, but the actress who played Susan was someone who's pretty well known now. And she was great. I thought the the girl who played Susan was fantastic. I love Susan. And she does in the book, does she go to Mansfield Park with yeah, Fanny? Yeah. Okay, good. I was so I was like, yeah, Susan gets to get the hell out of here. <laughs> Portsmouth sucks. Um <laughs> but and you know, at the very beginning, our narrator, who is Amanda Root, tells you, um, that Fanny's mother had married foolishly. She'd married for love, which was just like such a beautiful, like kind of that classic Austin kind of satire wordplay that I really love. Um, it was just so good. Everybody listened to it. it was so good. Okay. Sorry, Kristen. What else did you want to say? No, that's okay. I mean, it's just, I want to coo over like the way they did Portsmouth. I mean, it's annoying to listen to, you know, of course, but when she they're all shouting, all the kids all are screaming shouting. at each other and it's it's a, shirt. Yeah, yeah, hard to follow. And the father comes in and is like, pipe down, Earl, <laughs> you know. And um, yeah, they're all just, it's this chaos that you can portray just with voices and so many clamoring voices where the younger brother, Sam, maybe needs his shirts to be finished so he can get off. Uh, you know, William comes in and his dad's like, you're, the ship is already moored. You know, you're late. You got to get on the ship. They're going to take you out. And then it's just chaos. And he has to be like, um, Fanny's here. And he, the dad gets to say the line about like, you'll be wanting a husband soon. He doesn't even know what to say to her. And it just like made it all so real that it's maybe a, like, it's a little, sometimes I'm just kind of like, okay, just because you don't have a lot of money doesn't mean that everyone is like totally uncouth and everything. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just more a function of how many people were living in the space yeah. rather than the fact that like they're poor, so they're rude. But I mean, she says in the very beginning, she's writing the letter to her sister. And doesn't she say like, as I anticipate the birth of my ninth child or 11th child, you're like, oh my God, like you already are just like... <laughs> 
the, the book makes it very clear too that she's a very poor household manager, right? She hasn't been brought up to it. She's been brought up rich and she's not like Mrs. Norris, who, who as the book says, would have been a far more respectable mother of nine yeah. on a small income because she knows how to budget. She knows how to do things. And um, so it's not just that they're poor. It was making it awful. Um, but but yeah, but that that was very effective. Norris too nice. Yeah, it seemed really terrible. She didn't get the same ability to be evil. She didn't get yeah, all the. He just, she's yeah. just sort of always like, well, I guess a poor. It's up to me, a poor widow. Blah blah blah. I guess I'll have to do it. She's kind of always put upon and doesn't really do anything. Um, but like, I don't think we really get her. She's not a like the a villain sort of. She's not as evil and corrosive yeah. as in the book because there just wasn't a lot of time. They do write. I agree. Barbs. They do leave in the considering who and what she is and then the line where Edmund is too angry to speak, which does still seem like just so wishy-washy that she has, you know, Mary Crawford has to be Fanny's defender and take her aside and, and protect her emotionally from further harangue. Yeah. So they they try to do a little bit, but it it still just doesn't cr- come across as like that evil yeah. North. Okay, and that's the only leave. kind of real change, I think. Yeah, I think that I did. would say, like, eh, that I wasn't they, really pleased with. They weren't effective. Like, I think they they tried, but they just didn't have enough space and time t- t- to do that kind of banality of evil kind of thing. And um, Lady Bertram wasn't as flaky or flighty. Um, you know, the Lady Bertram with the pug. Yeah, I mean, she didn't really do it. Again, she just kind of sat on the couch. Gotta love the pug. <laughs> the pug got some good lines. Yes, pug, don't eat it. Edmund doesn't agree with you. At one point, Edmund is so up, fluttered and pressed over whether Mary Crawford loves him or not. This is, I think, is the before the ball that he takes Pug out and is talking to Pug. Yes, it's so genius. He's like monologuing to Pug while they're walking. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what do you think, Pug? And Pug's like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> they have a sound of him panting and stuff yeah it's, it was it's 100 percent just a dude being like <laughs> like making the noise they are not gonna bring a dog into the studio to do that this just makes me think of like the old radio shows where they just had sound people who would do the foley yeah yeah the foley stuff okay so note notes wise so tom he goes to Antigua, right? He comes back from Antigua, and he, the, he's back at home. The Crawfords are there. Mary Crawford's singing. By the way, she's singing, My Mother Bids Me Bind My Hair With Bits. My mother bids me to my hair. I was like, <laughs> what a fun, I, I mean, it's got to be purposeful, right? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, they're going to. It's got to be. It's got to be an Easter egg. They know what they're doing. Come on. Yeah. But I enjoyed tom and his sly humor he's talking to fanny about edmund falling in love with mary crawford and he says are not all men essentially the same and fanny pushes back and she's like i, I don't believe that <laughs> he's like no uh, he still has a she has a higher bar but he this is another interesting sidebar Tom talks about how awful it is to be in Antigua and you're getting fried in the sun mm-hmm. and, you know, the accommodations aren't great, whatever. And, uh, and then he talks about, oh, my father loves it. He loves to be in charge and arrange things and go into the field and run the plants through his fingers. And there is no explicit reference to the fact that right. human bondage is involved. And then um, it, later... When tell me what you thought about this later, Sir Thomas comes home and they did a totally original scene where Sir Thomas goes to Fanny and says, Fanny, things are changing in five, 10, 15 years. Our way of life will be totally different. And Fanny says, you're rooted here at Mansfield Park. You're like those trees. They change from year to year, but you'll always be rooted and you'll be loved for who you are here or something. And I just were like, I don't know what they're doing here. I don't 100% know what societal change they're talking about. I don't know. Is this is this like slavery legislation in Britain is coming down the pipe or something? I 
didn't read it as that. I think, I mean, the the point of the piece is just about how everyone's worried about change, right? But Fanny is always just kind of like, if we just stay here where we know we belong, we'll weather it no matter what it is, right? And again, I think it was just another way to kind of show her as connected to Mansfield Park. Another nature reference right. with Fanny. Um, we get a lot of Fanny at Mansfield Park nature references when they talk about cutting down things at Sutherland, too. She's like, oh, no, don't cut down the trees. I think it's just supposed the root, the rooting, I think, is like one of her real, um, excuse me, one of her like real metaphors of her. She was ripped up from her home and tra- transferred to Mansfield Park and planted there. But that's where she's blossomed. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's just sort of like if we stay true to ourselves, if we stay true to the places we love like we can in terms of the change they're talking about broadly i wouldn't give this i I, to me this radio you know people have been talking about mansfield park and how it's been there's readings of it and bay was asking about this actually readings of it about slavery and the subtext and things like that i do not think that this radio drama was interested in engaging with that and that's fine It doesn't have to. So I think it's just maybe more about how like the aristocracy, the landed gentry would soon not have as much money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the curve of history starting from that point is for more people to have more power. And I think they're just sort of hinting at that generally. I I mean, I don't know enough about English history. Maybe the person who wrote this had something very specific in mind. Yeah. I just sort of interpret it as a general, like, well, in, you know, a hundred years, these people are going to be land rich and money poor. Kind yeah, of deal. I guess the Industrial Revolution and 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 whatnot was going on. So, like, even in Sanditon, they say land isn't what it was. You're, so, yeah, you're right. I think that's probably... Uh, yeah. And I don't want to, again, like, I don't want to answer as a expert because again the person who wrote it might have been referencing something specific that we just don't know about but i don't think you need to know that to sort of understand what they're talking about i have another note and we mentioned this already but fanny uh having scenes specific scenes with julia and later with mariah after their feelings are extremely bruised makes her so sympathetic so julia has the big shit fit when she can't be agatha and storms out of the room. And the very next scene, Fanny goes to her and says, Julia, are you okay? And Julia's like, I would could wish we never, you know, are doing this play or, you know, like whatever. It's a exchange where Fanny can kind of counsel her into, I don't know, a calmer frame of mind. And that makes her, makes Fanny very sympathetic. You know, in the book, it's like there's two silent sufferers are connected only by Fanny's consciousness. It's like, yeah, go to her. You know, you, this is essentially your sister. And then later, after Mariah is at breakfast with Sir Thomas and Henry Crawford, and Henry Crawford's like, yeah, I'm leaving. You know, this is after he's pressed her hand to his heart. And he's like, yeah, I'm leaving. And she goes out. And there's a scene where you just hear Fanny's voice. And Fanny says, Mariah, come inside. It's cold. You're so cold. And that just rends your heart for Mariah in a way that having that character say something out loud could never do. And it shows Fanny's caring nature in a way that really makes you yeah. love her. She comes off as very wise. Yeah. Always giving good advice. Um, she comes off as very wise. She comes off as smart. She comes off as very caring and very empathetic. She's very empathetic to a group of people who don't seem to ever care or notice how she feels. <laughs> yeah, who don't deserve it. <laughs> Even Edmund. Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. Actually, now that I think about it, it, at least in this, Mary Crawford is one of the only people who seems to actually care about Fanny. Like when she sees her walking by in the rain and brings her in and like makes her something, gives her some hot tea and helps her dry. Like that is one of the first times someone actually cares whether Fanny is okay in the whole thing. We did lose um, Fanny must have a horse. So we lost all that Mm -hmm. like little vignette about how Edmund wants her to have her horse we did keep in how Edmund lets Fanny Crawford stay out with the horse too late, you know. Oh, Mary, yeah. Mary Crawford, excuse me. Yeah, with Fanny's, with Fanny's horse. Fanny's I'm making horse. little quotes, yeah. And then she yeah. doesn't ride for like three months or something like that because Mary Crawford is always off-riding. Isn't, isn't it great how we don't have the um, 
uh, one audiobook where Mary Crawford talks so slowly. Because I just remember her saying, like, selfishness must be forgiven because there's no hope of a cure. <laughs> it's like, I'm so I thought that I thought the actress was fantastic. She was great. Yeah, she um, was. Really and great. it seems like they were going for a sort of Mary Crawford's personality is very much informed by the people she's around. So when she's at Mansfield, she is like clever and and nice, but she's nice and she genuinely cares about them. And when she says, you know, it's only been six months, but I feel like it's a family that I'm with, like you believe her. And then there's a lot of this when she goes back to her other friends, they start poisoning her and like, you know, she starts going down this like sort of darker path that leads to her being like, well, Tom's totally going to die. So this could work out pretty well. Um, and it's not like it's her fault. There, I think I, I heard like three different references to people. And Edmund even says it. It's like, well, it's just the people she was hanging out with. They've just totally changed her. And I thought that was interesting. You know, what? I don't know if it's in the book, but I noticed it in this for sure. Absolutely. It's in the book where he's like her friends are, you know, have turned her mind. And you're that's so insightful that she does when she leaves Mansfield, she says, you all have so much heart among you. Mm -hmm. And Henry Crawford seems to feel the same way that he's yeah. come to the country and all of a sudden he has value for this sort of uh, empathetic, uh, religious woman, principled woman that if he were in London, man, not even interested. Um, and, uh, you know, he, this is, it's so true. This is a digression, but when he goes to Portsmouth and Fanny's there and he's looking for her opinion and approval and he comes and he says, I've gone back to my estate. I've, uh, I've looked into some cottages there. I have tenants I never even mm -hmm. knew about. And he wants her approval because he's adopted a way of life and a way of thinking that's totally new. And he, but he's such a weak character that he says, do you think I should go back? Do you think I should go back again? And he, she has to say, I, we all have a better guide yeah. inside of us. But when she says it, and I, I know I already said this, but I'll say it again in a longer, more verbose way. When she says that to him in this radio drama, it's not a prudish little Sunday school lesson. It's a thing where he is so lost as just a human being to principle uh, you know, it's a general idea that he has to be a steward of land and and people and 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 when he asks her this, totally, it's not a naive question. It's just that he's just so at sea with the idea of his responsibilities. It's it just really illustrates he is not ready for. He's not the man that she needs. He's not a man that she can respect. And it's this very gentle counsel, like you'd say to a child, like, well, we have a good, a better guide inside of us. I don't, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Yeah, you I see that. You know what to do. I see what you're saying. I actually had a different interpretation of that. I interpret it as he respects her so much and her opinion that he asks her because it's basically like, I know you will have the answer. Um, and of course it's something she doesn't know anything about. She doesn't know anything about running his estate. Um, and so she's basically like, well, I don't know, like you're the one who knows. Yeah. So it's sort of like her even like telling him like the answer was inside you all alone. It's like me with Alex. You can do it. Just try. Like you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it actually, I had kind of a different response to it where I'm like, he so respects her opinion that he wants to know what she thinks about something, even if it's outside her realm of experience. And then she's supporting him to be like, you know that you can answer this yourself. There's a theory in education, the field of education, called the zone of proximal development, where a, a student, a child can't do something on their own quite yet. But if you're there and you've modeled the behavior, and they're with you, they're in the zone of proximal development where if they just have that little bit of support or encouragement, then they can do it. Yeah, and absolutely. He is. He's in a zone of development. And that's why it's so heartbreaking when he just 
go. And you know what? That that is the shortfall. That is the failing of this radio drama, because you truly do not understand what happened with them. How did he go from loving Fanny Price to just going to London and all of a sudden eloping? They needed at least one scene where he's at Mariah's party and Mariah's mean to him. And he's peaked and he like tries to get her back on his side. He's That's- just like, it's I'll never win her. It's over. And so he just does that because he's like drunk and desperate and heartbroken. But I mean, that I th- they leave a lot of ambiguity there, which I like, where it's like, did he the, the eternal question? Did Henry Crawford really love Fanny Price? And so the ambiguity, I think, without that scene, you still don't know. Right. Yeah. Why did he go off with Mariah? Did he really not love Fanny? Is it all like kind of an act? Did he just convince himself he'd changed? Was he heartbroken because she had fi- he finally believed she would never pick him? And so he just did something really stupid because he was really depressed and sad about, you know, we don't know. Yeah, I, I little I'm a little bit worried about people who are unfamiliar with the story going, wow, that was a real deus ex machina, you know. That well, was- I mean, that's Austin. Yeah, well. Okay, come on. Remember Northanger Abbey when it's like, oh my God, the guy that she was in love with inherited all this money and they could be together. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, the book has far more support for what Henry does. The book goes into that actual scene, you know, when she's she's frosty to him or not. It's not it's not verbal. There's no dialogue, but there's a description of what happens. And um, he's like, I'm going to make. I'm going to make Mrs. Rushworth Mariah Bertram again in her treatment of me. And mm-hmm. it's that's how he traps himself into this invidious situation. And th- that's what the radio drama is missing. Just that one little link that would have made it clear. Yeah. And like certainly the same problem, what we would call a problem, still exists when, when um, Edmund goes to marry they kept this scene in where after they elope, Edmund goes to Mary and she's like, can you believe the folly of our two relations? And uh, he's horrified because she wants this marriage. And, you know, it all just seems very practical to us, the modern listener. I mean, that problem was but the not fact solved. that they got caught, not that they did it, yeah. that offended her. Sorry, this is a total digression. <laughs> there is no digression. We're just we're just shooting the shit. There's no digression. We're just I'm chatting. Sorry. Were you going to say something because I like totally seized no. control? No, I just like hearing what you say and then responding to it. That's our vibe, Kristen. We also lost, this was a bummer to me, uh, at the end of Lover's Vows, right? In the book, there's this whole big buildup where they're going to do the first run through, the first read through. And they're all up on stage in the middle of a scene and Julia bursts in, my father has come. And then it's like shit hits the fan. They didn't bother setting it up at all, so you don't it, need it. Just, just a little bit of rehearsal, and the yeah, it wasn't really needed, but it definitely took the panic away a little bit. Well, she does burst in. She's like, "My father is coming." Like, okay, but it's to- really funny when Tom's like, "Our father's locked in the library with Mr. Yates." And they're all like, "Oh, <laughs> oh my God, he's in there with Mr. Yates," and they're like, "Well, <laughs> you know, he's an idiot, so this is not going well." Yeah, and all but I we mean- still got the discussion about like the pink. Hello. Yep. And the, the Tom's outfit changes. You have to you have to have to keep that stuff in. And I, I liked that we we got Rushworth reading lines and Tom going, not and not my pleasure, my honor, and like yeah. interrupting him constantly. Rushworth does a lot better in this radio drama at remembering his lines than I think we're supposed to take away from the actual book. <laughs> well, Toby Jones is too much of a professional to like, right. try to imply that he doesn't know what he's doing. That's, that's right. I feel like Rushworth didn't seem like as much of a doofus. Like, he's really not bright. Yeah. yeah. But and I think Toby Jones is so charismatic again. Like, you just like everybody. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Even Mrs. Norris comes off okay because everybody's so good. Um, He just is sort of like, blah. Not Toby Jones, obviously, but Mr. Rushworth doesn't seem like a fool. He just seems like someone who doesn't have a lot of personality. He's someone ordinary contrasted with someone extraordinary. Yeah. Rather than a complete buffoon who you cannot believe she is marrying. Yeah. And maybe that's more realistic, right? Yeah, it certainly makes him a more sympathetic character. It really does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just to revisit something. I wanted to say this earlier. 
what I was saying about how I feel like the piece itself is making the point that Mary Crawford changed after leaving Mansfield. Uh, the narrator herself says this too. So it's not like it's just Edmund wants to believe that because he doesn't want to believe the person he loved was like this. Just that Fanny doesn't want to believe that because she is distrustful of anyone not within her circle. Like the narrator, the person who speaks with the voice of the piece mentions that Mary Crawford is hanging out with her old friends again and has been changing. So it's sort of like baked into the thing that that's the thesis is that she has altered. Uh, Maybe Mansfield Park is supposed to be like this little bubble that because Fanny is there, is it Ted Lasso energy where when Fanny is in a place like the ripples (laughs) spread out and she positively changes the people around her? I would believe that in this adaptation. I, um, I do think, speaking of Mary Crawford and speaking of her sort of change, I do think there was a missed opportunity. So I think her change begins even before she leaves Mansfield when she's, like, thinking of going to London, right? When I think you would agree, like, she's like, oh, when my Edmund friends. leaves, maybe. Yeah, and so Edmund is, le- like, the night of the ball. What I've always wanted and the opportunity we missed again here with this adaptation, I've always wanted a scene between Edmund Edmund and Mary that night where they come to the point where she's really mean. You know, it says in the book she's she's mean and she says, I'll never dance with a clergyman. You don't hear them have it out. You never you, they don't have a big fight. She just is is rude and uh, then regrets it. I really want him to be able to say. Mary, what do you want me to do? Look around you. I've been born to this house. None of this is mine. Think about, I want a moment where he asks, think about what, how that makes me feel. Kristen, and he, that's that, a modern reader thing, though. Nobody ever talks about their actual feelings, especially not in the 1800s. Come on. Nobody did that. This, this, this radio drama definitely has, it has the big fight between Edmund and Fanny, which is as written in the book, they're just having a fond conversation where he's like counseling her it's about Henry, about Henry. And they turn it into a fight in this drama. And I feel like they're willing to be more explicit about feelings because they have limited time and they want to like bring those. Con- I just I really miss it. I I know he's too good and too staid and stolid and and accepting of the current order natural order they think you're right that he wouldn't have said it organically as like a character back in that time however he he doesn't come off well in that fight either because he's she's like i know you're gonna say i should marry him he's like no you should do if you don't love him you shouldn't do it and she's like oh thank god you support me and then he's like but (laughs) maybe you could love him and she's (laughs) like oh my god and they're on horses. Not you too. And she rides away in an angry huff, which is satisfying. In I will tell you one thing. The thing that let me down was that we didn't get like an actual romantic scene between the two of them. It, it, the narrator is like, oh, they realize, he realized that, you know, the perfect woman was right there. And then they're like doing a cute ride where he's like, when I said we should race, I didn't mean you should win. But there was no like actual... If it was a movie, there would there wasn't a kiss scene, right? Yeah. And yeah. I really wanted that. Agreed. You know, I that's really a wanted that point. I mean, we Henry Crawford got to have all of these love stricken romantic things. speeches and and we still never got to this place where it's like, wow, I'm really happy Edmund married Fanny. They really hit it off there at the end and at a very... Well, he got it with Mary Crawford during Lover's Vow. I wanted something with yeah. him, like, being romantic to Fanny. And, like, that wasn't apparently important, I guess. Yeah, it's such a shame. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Well, maybe, I mean, maybe the radio drama thought that Henry Crawford was the, like the romantic choice and but Edmund's not the romantic choice. Edmund is like the choice that makes sense and is practical and makes sense and I said that twice. But you know what that's just like the kind of the thing. It's a great match, good for Fanny, but it's not like there's a lot of romance there. <laughs> it's certainly her like unrequited thing, but it still doesn't have the sexual charisma tension. Yeah. Yeah. Let Fanny Price be sexy. 
No one is ever going to accuse Fanny Price of being sexy. Babies, write it. <laughs> I know that. Where's the Mansfield Park adaptation? Roy, she's like, it's my nightmare for Davies to write Mansfield Park. He's going to sex up Fanny. And I'd I- love it. I love it. Mansfield Park is like begging to be. Okay, the whole lover's vow thing and the whole Mariah and he- like Mansfield Park is pretty sexy. The problem with Mansfield Park is that the main characters are not the ones who are sexy, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like <laughs> all around them. And then they're in here like really boring. And I don't know if that's what Jane Austen was going. Uh, this is Because it just seems very different from her other stuff, right? Because it seems very, not heteronormative. That's not the word I'm looking for, but like, just very like traditional Christian values and virtues. And that's not usually what I think about. Yeah, it needs to be more sexy. They need to be more sexy. I think my idea, I think that if you do an adaptation, I mean, Fanny is so isolated, so young, only has Edmund to tell her about things and tell her about the world and show her about the world that she... You have to portray her as having a sexual awakening and not being confused, like not knowing what to do with these feelings and having no one to guide her at all. And it becomes this obsession with Edmund. You have to write something in to show her physical desire for him. Just do a black, like in a black swan. What did number where she like masturbates and her mom is in the room? Damn. I do not remember that. Remember oh, my totally- God. She, like, wakes up one morning and she's like, I'll just go for it. Because that's her homework, right? The director tells her to, like, go home and pleasure herself. She wait- And she's like, okay, I'm going to go for it. And then she looks over and her mom had, like, fallen asleep in a chair in her room. And she had been, like, touching herself when her mom was in the room. And she's like, ah! And uh, oh, I hoped you would get that joke. And you didn't. So now it's just weird. Anyway, Black Swan was really messed up. um okay but just file this away for when we do our adaptation Kristen. that we're gonna make it we're gonna make edmund and fanny actually like have some heat wait you know kevin always talks about like you should do an adaptation and listening to this made me realize how like bad i would be at it and how not ready i am and like no you wouldn't you'd be great there are choices like there are so many choices that you make and it has to be well thought out really well thought out on you just get screenwriting for dummies. You're going to do great. As far The first thing I think that you really need to do is you don't just sit down and start writing. You get a big board. You write down your big story beats and you like put them on the board at like where you want, you know, if you're first at your three act structure, you have to figure out what beats go where. And then you sort of write around that. You got yeah. all these themes and you got to know where you're going and you, you can't throw the kitchen sink and you have to kill Kill your darlings, except in this case, it's Austin's darling. And that's very, very difficult. Um, yeah, you could do it. Just get David Tennant to be in it and it'll be great. Yeah, I know. I mean, like you said, performances just elevate the it's material. It's really too bad, though, because I was also just thinking, oh, this is the dream cast. And then I'm like, well, 20 years ago, <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch, Benedict Cumberbatch is not 25 or 22 or whatever he's supposed to be. You know what I'm saying? He's still hot in Doctor Strange, but yeah, oh, I don't totally. think... totally. But I mean, he's older than me, and I'm pretty old now, so... It's such a bummer, because I really want to have, like, a super horny crush on him as Doctor Strange, but the character sucks. Like, it, Yeah, he's kind of an a-hole. They should have let him know. be British. Just I know. Let, let Benedict Cumberbatch be British. Let David Tennant be Scottish. Like, let's just let people be who they are. Like, Anytime... What is his name? Anytime I see... Oh, God. What's the guy who's like, this is Sparta. What is that guy's name? Gerard Who was fan of the opera. Anytime I see Gerard Butler, if he is not Scottish, I'm like, what the fuck are we doing here, people? <laughs> what are we doing with our lives? Why are you going to hire Gerard Butler and then make him use this, like, mid-Atlantic, boring American accent? Why? You know what you do? You put in one line. Oh, yeah. My parents, I was, you know, uh, my dad was like U.S. Army, married a Scotswoman. We moved, you know, all it takes is one line to explain why he's Scottish in a movie. It's fine. Yeah. He, he's in the Secret I, Service or whatever. We're like, isn't he in White House Down or something like that? Just one line to explain. It's fine. It's fine. The Phantom of the Opera can be Scottish. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> fine. 
Uh, <laughs> Nobody cares. House could have been British. Yeah. Yeah, why Hugh not? Laurie. Yeah, right? I didn't even know Hugh Laurie was English, though. That's how good his accent is. His accent is top notch. Well, what's his face gets to be the Australian because he is Australian. And uh, what's so maybe his face? Hugh Jackman? No, in house, the blonde guy, Jesse Spencer. He gets to be Australian because he is Australian. Oh, yeah. Oh, the, like the young, hot, young, hot doctor <laughs> guy. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people are Australian that you don't know. A lot of people are Australian that you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bay, my husband, Bay, he gets really upset when he finds out that actors he really likes are Australian. <laughs> because for some for some reason he really hates australian accents oh. they drive him crazy yeah he really hates them they like it's like fingernails on a child i don't it doesn't make any sense people um but he'll be i'll be like you know they're australian and he's like mm. well, he gets so <laughs> mad like margot robbie oh he was so mad when he found margot robbie's was. australian where have i been you didn't know that no everybody's australian now i told you <laughs> that's right I love an Australian accent. I, I think it's really appealing. I, I I was in love with Jesse Spencer. I mean, recently I rewatched House and I recently got the kind of crush on Jesse Spencer that had me on Tumblr looking at <laughs> looking at House give accounts and like House, you know, like all the scenes and they like make it into those little memes with all the lines oh my god this is like me in 2001 in my dorm like googling people that i really liked and this is when there were still like 10 internet browsers and i was just <laughs> looking up guys that i thought were hot in the early days of the internet you're yeah. on net i took <laughs> yeah no uh, excuse me i preferred what's the one the mount vista or something no i actually thought i really liked messing around with ask jeeves because i thought that was just really cute that you could ask. Do you remember Ask G? Yeah. Mm. I specific. This is such a tangent. Uh, you can cut it out. I specifically remember watching Angel my sophomore year of college. And this is a big spoiler for the first season of Angel. So stop listening if you don't want to hear it. But Doyle dies. Mm -hmm. And it was like in the fifth episode or something. And Joss Whedon purposely did it to show like, this is a different show. Nobody is safe. I will kill characters. I was so devastated. I got obsessed about reading spoilers. And so I was like trolling every Angel Buffy website I could find trying to find trailers, uh, spoilers, because I did not want to be heartbroken like that again. Oh, I, know. I was so upset. Right. Well, you know, that actor had a drug problem. No, it was, and then he later died in real life. It was very so sad. sad. I think that's very, why very they had to do it so soon, though, because it was like he wasn't showing up and he didn't know his life. No, I hadn't heard that. I mean, I, the only things I read was that Joss Whedon had planned it from the beginning. He had told him, like, this is not a full season. You're only contracted. We want to really, like, if this is an, an adult show compared to Buffy. We want to show to people that we're, like, operating at a different level here. I hadn't heard that. It was a response to that. That's interesting. You must be right. I mean, my mom was so into Angel and Buffy. She was on the boards, you know, the discussion boards that you would type first when the page refreshed because to be at the top of the page. Anyway. And then you would uh, say first. Yes. To try so to be she, the first person to leave a comment. She was a member of an organization called Viewers for Quality Television, which only existed in the late 90s. And they would give out awards uh, and they were so they got so big that these actors started coming to receive their cues. An amazing the story, Kristen. It's wild. You go to her house and you look at her um, photo albums and she has pictures with her and Joss Whedon, pictures with her and everybody. Allison Hannigan. She was actually Allison Hannigan wasn't there like the, the event that she went to. But yeah. So my mom met Joss Whedon. Right. And my mom leaned in. And whispered to him, thank you for the hour's pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> no, absolutely not. He said he laughed and she was so proud of herself. <laughs> absolutely not. Especially now that we know everything we know about Joss no, Whedon. She feels bad Mom. now. She's like, she, nobody knew he was a bad guy at the time. Okay, right? but that is such an incredible story. <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> I love your mom so much. I've only met your mom like twice, which is kind of wild considering how long we've known each other. But like, 
her obsession with Phantom of the Opera. Oh, yeah. This story. Like, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Your mom. These are, this is gold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be in that group. That sounds so fun. Yeah. It, they, um, it dissolved. I once got sent a Nielsen survey. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. fun. That's exciting, isn't it? You're like, oh, my opinion matters. <laughs> yeah. That's it. I wasn't like a Nielsen household, but I did fill out a survey once in the mail. Like it was an actual legit random survey. Cash in the envelope. I got $5 in cash. They shouldn't be. I don't be know sitting. if I got any money. Yeah. I was wondering if it was because at the time I had the TV blog. I was like, oh, maybe they've like turned on to my TV blog. Yeah. TV sluts. What was it? Called? Yeah. Hell yeah. It was called TV sluts. Nice. It was great. Well, it was really called We're Wicked Smot. Um, <laughs> but the URL was tvsluts.com. And then people were like, are you sure you want it to be that? <laughs> I was like, that's well, great. <laughs> you could have we had a lot of money that domain. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Or it was TV Sluts on Blogspot. This is Blogspot. This was oh, like 2005. Mm-hmm. Um, at one point, we I had like five or six people writing for me. It was just my friends. They would just do it for free. But it was really cool. No, I remember this because somehow I got on the list of people you would email and chastise for not making the deadline. Well, you know, nobody ever actually, I had to really browbeat people. If you don't offer money, there's no incentive and people don't do it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're this not- is why Nielsen sends out $5 because <laughs> yeah. they know you, then you feel obligated to return the survey, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is why the charities send you like address labels. Yeah, I know. And the International Refugee Committee or whatever, the IRC, I have to figure out how to get off their list because they send me greeting cards. Like, mm. and then you feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, please don't waste your money. I, I mean, I give, but I have organizations that I give to every month. So, yeah. So it's like, I, you know, I'm just maxed out on those. I'm not looking for like a new thing to give to. So anyway. Kristen, are we done talking about Mansfield Park? I think I'm done. I, I, I went through all my notes and okay. um, I just loved it so much. Thank you uh, so much for for telling me how much you loved it and getting me into like this super hyped headspace. And then it turned everyone, out- everyone, I have to let everyone know. I couldn't believe it. I listened to it and I loved it. And I messaged Kristen and I was like, Oh my God, Kristen, this is so good. It's so amazing. Thank you for telling me about it. And she was like, Oh, I haven't listened yet. And I was like, oh, I'm like I thought for sure anything Mansfield park related, but I'd forgotten about your not liking audio storytelling that much which i assume was kind of a barrier for you to like dive right in it was and the other thing was work for the record whoever is listening i just wound up cutting it all out uh <laughs> yeah put that part in though but it'd just be like a do to do at this point i told a really long story about how i, I messed up like, something at work. Long story about a super traumatic thing that happened at work that it yeah um but, but then, so that me. everybody knows everything ended up fine don't worry Kristen's fine I hope you're right. It's cool that you're in therapy. I saw my doctor who does my med adjustments and I was telling her this story and it took me like 15 minutes to tell this story. And she was like, wow, that was her first thing she said was that was a long way around that story. And then <laughs> she's rude as fuck. Like she's. Oh, well, sometimes you want your therapist to be rude. No, they call it a shaggy a- dog story. This is the this is the point she's making. She's like, that was for your therapist. Uh, I <laughs> and your pharmacy medication manager. I just need to make sure that you're not going to die if you take like this and this together. <laughs> and then she goes, OK, you're clearly hyperverbal. I'm su- prescribing you this to bring you down out of hypomania. And like um, and then she's like, go see your therapist. And I'm like, I don't have one. <laughs> she, she's like, you probably need <laughs> <laughs> well i love having a therapist we have we've actually heard from several people that they appreciate us being open about our mental health struggles so i will say that i started seeing a therapist after my son was born a few months after because i had developed really bad anxiety due to the pandemic and having a baby and your brain chemistry changes and it was crazy and i actually started oh my big news 
God. My big news for the new year is that I started an as needed anti anxiety medication, which I didn't know was a thing. I thought you had to take like a daily. You don't. They have as needed. So when you start to feel yourself sort of like spiraling, you can take it and it helps. And it's so great. I love it. I've only needed it maybe five times in January, but it's just even just knowing it's there is so wonderful. Yeah, that's and it helps me sort of like identify the triggers of things that, you know, start to get me spiraling up into anxiety. And it's just so great. I just I highly recommend (laughs) anti anxiety with the kitchen for everybody. Recommend is the drugs. Yeah. (laughs) But it also like finally it started because the holidays were so I didn't realize I was spinning out a lot. Um But right before Christmas, we got a message from my mom that she had COVID. She had COVID last year at Christmas. And it was like three years before, three days before Christmas Day. And she texted me and she's like, well, I've got COVID. And she had just been over to our house the night before. We were with my husband's family, including our baby niece, who was only like five months old at the time. And I basically had a panic attack in front of my in-laws. Um... Because for me, one of the big triggers of anxiety is health stuff. Mm. And COVID for some is like a huge one. And I was just like, I can't go through my life having these overblown reactions to things where like I'm nauseous for three days um, and things like that. So I decided to ask my doctor for an anti-anxiety medication, which she was totally supportive of. But just making that decision and making a positive step to help myself felt so good. Because we yeah. feel powerless, right? Yeah. But if you can actually do something to sort of not even control, but like try to move the needle towards helping yourself, I find it so beneficial. Well, um, unless we have anything else, anything else to share, any like TV shows or anything, we, we can... Before we do that, I, we need to give a shout out. We need to go to the Wheat Sheath. Oh, yeah. Because we had a really lovely email. Lisa, Lisa sent us such a a wonderful email where she has listened to all of our episodes starting at the beginning. And she promised herself when she reached the end, when she caught up, she was going to email us and reach out. And I'm so glad she did. Um, It was such a lovely message to receive. It really made my day to hear from her. Yeah, it was so sweet. Yeah. So, oh, Kristen. Yeah, I was having a really bad day. It was really nice to get that. Oh, so Lisa, thank you so much. We yeah, love hearing from you. Thank you so much. And for anyone else who wants to reach out, please do. Kristen, what's our email address? It is first.impressions.podcast at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. We are, oh God, it's not Twitter. Oh, the X. Do I have Whatever. to say that? It's Twitter. Come on. Yeah. Please I'll, reach out. I'll never stop calling it Twitter. Do you have anything that you want to recommend? We're watching Station Eleven on HBO. Oh. You have to be in the right headspace. Like you have to be prepared to receive information that might hurt hurt you. Like <laughs> it's about yeah. a pandemic that causes the end of civilization. And yeah, but it's extraordinary. Like if you can get through like the first episode, which is a little bit slow, but we were hooked. I read the book and I thought it was beautiful. Uh, the book came out pre-COVID by several years. I will not watch this show. Mm. My vibe for 2024 is no bummers. <laughs> I have like a strict no bummers policy. I don't know if I'd say that it's like all a bummer, but there's a lot of bummers in Station Eleven. And so I'm not going to engage with that. Thank you very much. I love this idea, though, like the traveling Shakespeare company. What is it? Survival is not sufficient. Yeah. 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 Like we can't just survive. You have to have art. You have to have beauty. There has to be something. We're humans. We need it. I loved that sentiment. But yeah, I can't do the show. (laughs) Yeah. No, understood. Like Kevin has this other thing where he has a long list of movies that he's always wanted to watch or he like missed, you know, he's like, we're going to watch movies. And I'm like, damn it, because like a movie is such a commitment. We finally watched the Dungeons and Dragons movie, which um, I know it was so great. It was so it starts slow. Like you have I'm to, glad you like it. Yeah. Loved oh, it. I loved it. And there's this line, Chris Pine 
who stars in it, gets this line and it it got me through the week. It was, we can never stop failing. Stop failing. Because the minute stop we stop failing, we failed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought she, uh, that movie is so incredible. I went, I, I mean, I'm a big D&D fan. I run a D&D fifth edition game every month. Um, I've been a fan since I was a kid. I went into it with really low expectations because every time we've they've tried to do a movie in it, it's terrible. And it was so good. I rented a private theater for my birthday the year it came out. And hosted like 30 people to watch it with me was how much I loved that movie. That was what I did for my birthday that year. <laughs> I loved it. And this was back. So when that came out, though, it was not super expensive to do that because AMC just wanted people in the theater, right? So you could do it for like 150 bucks or something. It was crazy. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you liked it. I love that movie so much. Loved it. That's good. Um, what have we been watching? We... Finished Lupin, which is really fun. Bay and I are really into like mysteries and puzzles and heists and things. We've been doing a lot of logic puzzle video games. Mm. Um, something called The Case of the Golden Idol, which was great. If you're, they're really fun to do with someone else. You can sort of um, play off each other with it. I've been reading a lot. I read um, Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone, which was really fun. And the sequel just came out. Uh, yeah, again, but like a cozy murder mystery is okay. That's not a bummer. Yeah, it has yeah. to be cozy. Yeah. We've been rewatching Columbo. Oh my God. Oh, no. <laughs> Just one more thing. One more thing. What's up? Okay. When I was a kid, I always wondered, did Peter Falk like have a stroke or something? Why was like one eye always closed? Do you know what I mean? Was that just an affectation for Columbo, or was that how his face was? Do you find him weirdly hot? Because I do. You're not alone in that uh, sentiment. <laughs> I personally, not really, but I know that you are not alone. <laughs> I won't tell you how I know that you're not alone. But that's not an unusual response. And she also wasn't that old. As a child, I remember thinking like, oh, this old guy. But he was probably like 50 when they were making that. Younger than that, he had this full thick head of hair. He was oh, he was probably my age. But when you're a kid, I was like, oh, he's so yeah, old. Oh, he's he was so like, old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah no. Okay. Well, I'm glad. That, so you're just like panting over Peter Falk. I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, before we go, um, we have to talk about Love You, Ari. Oh, yeah. On the Hallmark Channel. I saw Paging Mr. Darcy last night. You're going to love it. Whoever I have recorded it on the DVR. I haven't watched it yet. I'm very excited. I've heard get there's a new Jane Austen themed movie every Saturday evening in February on Hallmark Channel. Yes, that and that's called Love You, Ari. And they did the first one this past uh, yesterday. And I. I forgot it was happening, but then I saw um, Jane Austen first drafts posted about it. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to get the app and like watch it really fast. And like whoever wrote it, her name is Rina Hardy. She clearly did her homework. She clearly read um, Among the Janeites. She clearly read Camp Austen. She wrote this hilarious. And like having been to Jasna, it's just like Jasna. Oh, I can't it's wait. You little love story about. It's about a Jane Austen scholar, right? Yes, she gives a okay. keynote. She's going to give a keynote at the Jane Austen League of America, JALA, right? Okay. Uh, they did all these little cute, like, tweaks, so it's not, like, real. Yeah. You know, she gets a Mr. Darcy, a fake Mr. Darcy assigned to her to be her, like, conference liaison. And, of course, they, they fall in love. First they clash, and then they, yeah. So, and they're, it's culminating in a new sense and sensibility. Yes. Movie at the end of the month. But there's one where coming up where it's a librarian is the main character and like Jane Austen gives her like advice or something. So it's my exact profession and my exact hobby. And I'm like going to watch it, but I'm probably going to hate it. So I'm going to. Oh, yeah, it. you're going to hate it. You're absolutely going to hate it. It's, so it's like she has visions of Jane. There are going to be so many librarian tropes. Maybe I've conflated the two different plots. But anyway, 
I'm we'll ready. See. You will hate it, I'm sure. Infuriated. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we can talk about some of these in a future episode. We'll yeah. do like a love you airy read. Yes. No, oh God, do I have to watch all these movies now? You don't act like you're so put upon. You want to watch them. <laughs> you're I gonna- only watched two romantic comedies in all of December. Oh, and oh, in all of much. December. Oh, wow. Yes. Well, usually I'd be glued to the Hallmark channel. I didn't watch any on Hallmark. They were both on Netflix. Thank you very much. Um, I was very proud of myself. I was busy. Good job. Good job. Yes. Maybe that's why I was so anxious. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. See, see, ask your therapist. Yeah. I'm meeting with her tomorrow morning. I will. Say hi. <laughs> hi, Linda. Hi, <laughs> All right. All right. Always a pleasure, Kristen. Yeah, you say the thing. Yeah, we should say the thing. Me say the thing? Yeah. All right. Listeners, we have delighted you long enough. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye.